Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's Word we'd like to look at this evening is from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 22, verse 66. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. This is God's word. Jesus' name, and to his glory, my dear friend. They had just had a nighttime meeting the religious leaders of the Jews, that is. And Jesus was before them. They had come up with a conviction that no one who would have observed it in an impartial way would have agreed with. They found Jesus worthy of death. And then they started to beat him over and over again and spit on him again and again. And then when all that was done, they took a little time to compose themselves and then they had a trial for Jesus. Doesn't that sound weird? We had just heard that they had a trial. They had done it all. And yet now we hear they're having another trial. Well, they did all of that, but only sort of. You see, according to the Jewish law, it was illegal for the Sanhedrin, the rulers, ruling people of the people of Israel, to meet at night to have court cases at night. They did it at that time so that they didn't have to worry about getting their point of cross and meeting the goal that they wanted to meet. So that's what they did. They had this trial that was under the cover of darkness in a number of ways, first of all, the time. But also there were certain members of that ruling body who were kept in the dark about that meeting even occurring. Because they were worried that they wouldn't get the verdict they wanted, the guilty verdict. So, the next morning, in order to do things right and legal, they had to have another hearing. And that's what they did. They had another hearing uh, as the, because of the reason, as the author of that Crucial Hours wrote, they were extremely anxious to maintain a semblance of legality. Part of the reason that they held that official trial was so that they could cover all their bases. There were those who may not have gone along with their verdict, men like Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus who were part of that Sanhedrin, but they were also secret followers of Jesus. More than likely, they didn't attend that evening meeting. And if they were to find out that that took place, if they were to find out that the guilty verdict had already been given, well, what if they turned up at Pilate's courtroom? And what if they said how the trial they had was illegal? Would the case be thrown out on a technicality? 
You see, the, the religious leaders, I believe, felt that they were more afraid of the case being thrown out on a technicality than if than they were afraid of Pilate not agreeing with the guilty verdict. They could take care of him. I think there was another reason why they put on this second trial or official trial, this semblance of legality. And that's because they were about to carry out an evil plan. And they wanted that evil plan to be seen by everybody. And they wanted everybody who saw that evil plan to think that they were doing good. They were doing their job. And what's more noble than doing your job, especially if your job is a difficult one like maintaining justice and order and executing judgment. They wanted the people to think that they were noble. In a way, I can understand why people think this way. Why people think that it's better to have a semblance of legality. And it's better to have a semblance of legality because it's easier. It's easier than actually being doing the right thing, the legal thing in every aspect. Easy or it's easier for us because it's it's only doing something that's legal at one point or in one part of your life. Whereas God demands that everything needs to be done perfectly at all times in every part of your life. Take, for example, the third commandment. God says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It's easy to put up a semblance of legality with that. If I go to church twice, or three times, or four times a month, then people will think that I'm keeping all of God's will because they can see me doing this one thing. And that's really the heart behind this semblance of legality. You only have to do part just enough to make it look like you're doing it right. And, and people will look favorably on you. And when they look favorably on you, think that you're living a good life, well, then that gives you a lot of room to do things that you may not want them to know. Even though we can fool people with the, a semblance of legality, we can't fool God. He sees everything that is being done. True Christianity is not just doing things by the book. Now, maybe we should halt, take a little pause here and so I don't get misunderstood. Doing things by the book can be a good thing. In fact, it can be a, a Christ-like thing, doing things by the book. You may have heard um, one of the pastors this, this year talking about um, when Jesus used, uh, spoke the words, I will keep the Passover. And during that one, we focused on how Jesus kept every aspect of God's law in every way. He kept, he did things by the book perfect. 
So when I say Christ, true Christianity is not just doing things by the book, what I really mean is not just doing the things necessary, following the rules so that people don't accuse you of breaking section 4, subparagraph 22a. True Christianity also involves doing things that you're not bound to do by the law. Jesus was bound by the law so that he couldn't commit murder. And so he didn't pull out a sword in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Jesus wasn't bound to heal the ear of the man that Peter, whose ear the Peter cut off. He wasn't bound to do that. But he did it anyway. True Christianity is about my love for my neighbor. It's not just about following the law or being concerned about the law. It's also being concerned about the spirit of the law and about the purpose for which that law is to be used. People who live a semblance of legality don't care about the spirit of the law or the purpose of the law unless they can twist that to serve their own purposes. This is a problem that you and I have to admit that we have. Often, we like to put a semblance of legality on our lives. Do the things that people can see us do in the right way. Then when we're by ourselves, our sinful nature can do whatever it wants. God sees that. God sees not just our action, but he sees our heart. And he sees our motive. Those, those religious leaders, God saw what they were doing with their fake trial that they put on. He saw that they were practicing injustice in the truest sense of the word. He saw that they were causing offense to him and to his son. He saw their sin. God sees our sin too. He sees the actions we do. He sees the motives we have. He sees our heart. But he also sees Jesus. He sees how his son acted perfectly in every way, whether it was a, keeping the Passover or healing a man's ear. He saw Jesus' heart. He saw the, the, how he helped those around him, not so that people could look at him and see how good he was, but simply because he loved each and every individual he came in contact with. Jesus lived perfectly the way the law demands someone should live. And Jesus loved perfectly. And Jesus did all that for you and for me so that he could give his perfection to us. But he also kept the book perfectly, the book, as he fulfilled everything that God's word said about the coming Messiah. Jesus fulfilled that very first promise 
that, Jesus, that God gave that the Savior would crush the serpent's head. Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies of the prophets who said he would stand in front of that court silent without opening his mouth. That he would be beaten and abused. That he would go to the cross and become a curse as he took the sins of the entire world upon himself. That he would be stricken and smitten by God as God took the total force of his wrath and took it out on his son, punishing him for our sin. Jesus did that not to make himself look, not to benefit him. He did all that to make the world through his forgiveness look good. Jesus did that willingly and joyfully and lovingly. He did it because his heart yearned to have your heart belong to him. Knowing and believing that Jesus has done all this, now you and I can strive for bigger and better things. We don't have to concentrate on that semblance of legality, that fake, imperfect holiness and obedience. Because Jesus has given us true holiness with his obedience. And so we can strive for better things, strive for bigger things, like living for Jesus from the heart. Doing the right thing is doing it the right way for the right reasons with the right mo motive. And that's what Jesus has done for each and every one of you. He made your heart right with God. And he rules your heart so that you can live for God. So listen to Jesus. Learn from Jesus. Live for Jesus. Amen.